So Jim, the the channel basically went live two weeks ago. You know, we prepared several in advance just so that we can have some buffer whenever we get into a, like a deadline crunch with our drawing careers. And uh, some girl I know, she said that I sound like the love child of Beavis and Butthead meets Bart Simpson if he grew up to be a 35-year-old guy. And I took uh, offense to that. And then I listened back to some episodes and I said, God damn it, she's right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's not too bad. (laughs) I'll live with it, man. It's the cross-eyed bear. Here we have Wizard Magazine, number nine, May 1992, cover by Whitman, 91. This would be the third Bart Sears cover. He had to use the name Whitman because he had a DC exclusive contract at the time, which precluded him from doing outside comic work. They surely wouldn't be happy and thrilled with him doing wizard covers, and they probably doubly would be unhappy with him doing one of the flagship Marvel characters of the day, Venom. Man, I'm happy to have that mystery answered. That was actually something I was going to ask about. I have some comments on the cover real quick. All right, Venom poster inside, Venom's a hot character, fine. Batman 2 movie review and trading card guide. Are there other two headlines? There's an interview with Neil Gaiman in here. This is, the f- <laughs> this is the first comprehensive interview about Image Press that I'm aware of. Right. <laughs> the biggest selling... So millions and millions and millions of comics. None of that's mentioned. Where you go with the trading card guide. And the reason I make a big production, this is a good issue. There's some really great stuff in this issue, but you wouldn't know it from the, from the items they highlight across the cover. <laughs> Hindsight being 2020, I guess, man. Sure. You know, they didn't know what image they thought. Maybe they thought Youngblood was going to be the next Mike Grill Star Slayer or <laughs> something. Or Neil, Neil Adams' Ms. Mystic. Long history of creators going off on their own and doing their uh, creator-owned work that just uh, turns into a dead dead trout. For sure. This issue, to me, it was an emotional roller coaster, man. Because it simultaneously made me wish that I was a part of comics and the speculator boom of that era and other parts of this issue make me very glad that I wasn't in a creative space professionally during this time frame and hopefully as we continue throughout the issue like I'll be able to illustrate those points inside front cover the the new hipster trend of enamel pins is is age old man and here's (laughs) they were pimping a a set of Jack Kirby pins many issues ago, maybe issue four or something like that, but that must have been success- successful enough for them to, to branch out and start uh, using their more modern characters. Wolverine, Black Costume Spider-Man, McFarlane, Omega Red. That looked like it was drawn by a 12-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> Art, Art Tebow, uh, Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> or as I used to call him, Art Thibbert. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Once again, an advertisement for these damn Jim Lee X-Men trading cards. Uh, San Diego Comic-Con, 1992. Fun to run through some of their guest lists, so I'll just read a couple of those. Clive Barker, John Byrne, Bill Griffith, Craig Hamilton, Ray Harryhausen. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Jack Kirby, Terry LeBan, Todd McFarlane, Peter Milligan, Diane Newman, uh, Julie Schwartz, Gilbert Shelton, and Robert Williams are listed there for uh, guests. Heck of a show. The the one thing that I really wish that they would have um, included was general attendance numbers for what they expect. They said they're in a 125,000 square foot space. Um, who knows what the heck it is now? I should I should have looked that up, but I would like to have known what the attendance numbers were in 1992 um, because this is certainly before the the exponential ex- growth that occurred towards the end of the 90s. They list 150 exhibitors. Uh, I would be curious, you know, like that's a number I'm sure we could find for today's shows, and it's got to be in the thousands. Never thought I would see Rick Geary artwork in a <laughs> Wizard magazine, but he did. He did this, uh, at least this illustration. Uh, no, he did this one as well. Both of these illustrations uh, highlighting the, the 1992 San Diego Comic-Con. He created a strip that I think about a lot from Heavy Metal, and I I looked it up because the Heavy Metal numbers are always weird. It was in Heavy Metal, Volume 15, Number 5, and he did this story about Orson Welles' War of the Worlds that illustrated the mass hysteria 
of um, of the audience of the marks, and he has to give a public apology. And he's at on like sort of an ivory tower of RKO Studios or wherever the heck he is. And he gives the apology, and everybody who showed up to um, call for his head, you know, because he he made them look foolish and stupid. FCC branded him terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> Such quaint times, but he he eases everybody's mind they seem to like him in the end they drive off and then little antennae is that the plural for antennas <laughs> sure. uh antennae pop up from his head and the entire building is a spaceship and he just flies away that's cool i have to track that down i'm a big fan of that that broadcast and all kind of everything around that story is great marvel uk comic book ad you ever pick any of these things up None of those particular issues. Well, that's not true. I do pick them up now and then. I did not read them at the time. There's one, and and it's not on this, it's not on this ad. But somebody compared it to Aeon Flux, so I've actually picked it up. What was it called? You don't remember? I, I don't. I'd have to dig it out. But I just picked up a Hell's Angels. Uh, I think it had an X Men guest star. Death's Head Two is the big Marvel UK book for for me. That you know, I have picked several of those up. Liam Sharp is the outlier. I think that's probably accurate. I think Brian Hitch may have done a little bit of Marvel UK work at some point, you know, maybe towards the end of the run or whatever. They're they're weird comics. Like they're more and more I'm interested in them. <laughs> but at the time I was not. <laughs> Patrick Daniel O'Neill has been impressing me the, the past couple of issues with Spot his on. with his editorials. And uh, this letter from our editor, the Golden Age of Comics question mark. And he's he's asking the tough questions. Uh, where are the future of comics readers going to come from because at this time you know 1992 the the newsstand was a dwindling market and that's how he and every other kid his his age got into the comic book game often whenever i'm at um, conventions giving panel discussions and people ask you know where'd you come from i say that i'm basically the last remnant the last vestige of the newsstand comic reader you know born in 1982 so where are future uh, comics readers gonna come from? Um, hindsight being twenty twenty, we could we could make we could make some calls as to where readership came from after this point. Manga was very important. I was gonna say that's where the generation after ours probably came through. I can remember seeing kids in bookstores reading, you know, in the manga sections. But this would that would have been ten years after this article, you know, maybe even fifteen years after this article. Um, you're totally right on all of that. I, I completely agree with him. I agree with you. You know, this is focus on kids, focus on direct market versus mass market, and all spot on. An interesting thing to note at this time period, whenever records are being broken for comic sales on particular issues, but it is very easy to lose track of this part. So I commend Wizard for this, but it's noteworthy that it's black and white, it's small print. You know, it's very easy to skip this. It almost looks like ad copy. <laughs> right? It's it's no, not it's emphasized. True. You know, we're going to see full color spreads and, and, and bright, beautiful artwork elsewhere. This is about as much as you could possibly hide an article within this magazine. <laughs> he does say, uh, you know, if a kid does find comics and it's Wolverine, uh, Punisher, or Lobo... <laughs> What are they gonna think? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're gonna they're gonna like it, but but his claim is that like as parents, like uh, a responsible parent isn't going to put those comics into into their hand. And he has kids himself, and he would not let his child read a Simon Bisley Lobo comic. He calls out Disney Comics for pulling the plug on a very short lived newsstand line. Uh, ironic now that you know Disney does have the purse strings to so much of comics. And he also laments the uh, the cancellation of the ALF comic from Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> Two-page ad, more ad buys from Valiant. We'll, we'll cover them a little bit more later <clears throat> because we have to spend a little time on this. It's an article called Image Comics. Independent artists seek a new collective destiny. It opens up with the famous photo of the, the Image founding fathers in Mark Silvestri's Malibu home. Hey, that's not Will's Portacio. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it's somebody's kid. <laughs> it does. It does. And it, it is Hank uh, Canals. He did the writing on one issue of Youngblood. I, th I think he did a little bit of Brigade. And then he uh, went over to Wildstorm for a while. But, but he actually has 
an enduring um, legacy. From what I understand, I did some some digging. I didn't corroborate it with two sources, but I believe that it came from Eric Larson's mouth. But he created the image I. Wow, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. I mean, when, as you say, legacy is, is the right word for that. I mean, think of how many books have carried that and, and continue to carry that to this day. So that's impressive. If that's, if that's true, that's... Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's I'm, a feather in your in your hat. I'm ninety percent sure. Uh, now he is the uh, vice president of Vertigo. He seems to have a uh, lasting career in comics over the years. Yeah, he's landed on his feet. That's quite a resume. Here's a question I have for you, Jim. Who looks happiest in this photo, Jim Valentino or Hank Canals? <laughs> yeah, I think everybody in this photo has done well for themselves. <laughs> Listen to you, man. <laughs> February eighth of 1992 is the date that we could record as being the date that that image is technically formed they invited the the comics press at the time to give everybody the scoop about about what they've accomplished here what they've been up to they say that image comics will also be an imprint of the malibu graphics publishing group and some of the reps from malibu are here on hand to field some questions here and there so that's helpful towards the the end of of this piece but uh, there is a lot for us to unpack here with, uh, with this feature. Pretty early on, before we get into the interview portion, they're talking about what, some of the titles that are going to be coming out from the various creators. We know about Youngblood with Rob Liefeld. We talked about that before. Spawn, McFarlane, Wildcats by Jim Lee, Cyberforce by Mark Silvestri, The Dragon by Eric Larson, and not one, but two books from Slim Jim Valentino, The Pact and Clone with a K. Neither of which are his initial offering, but probably speaks to how early on in the process this interview is being conducted. When I was a kid and it was happening in real time, you know, things moved much slower. Three months, four months was forever, uh, you know, whenever I was 14. But looking back on it, like they're going from many of them are working, doing Marvel books while this interview is happening to in a couple of months having their books out via Image and Malibu, uh, it's it's a pretty quick turnaround. You don't see that now, especially in the age of the graphic novel, where you'll hear about a book and three years from now it'll be out. Wizard asks, well, who else is going to be a part of this this imprint, this this company? They mention Will Sportaccio is going to participate, and the comic he is going to do will be in collaboration with Chris Claremont, who was in England at the time and couldn't be there uh, for the interview, but they're currently hashing out the details of like of what that comic is going to be. Um, other names are mentioned throughout throughout the piece. Del Keown is going to be doing a comic, and and he, he'll start off by doing pinups. Sam Keith. Yeah, one of the books they they describe even by title is Darker Image, and they announce Rob Liefeld's Blood Wolf, Jim Lee's Death Blow, and Sam Keith. Although they don't name the Max here, but they do name Darker Image and they name Sam Keith. So that's pretty good because, again, this is very, very early. Another big get that they're very, very excited about is George Perez. He has commitments until 1993, but he promised, like, once he's done with those commitments, he's going to come over. He's going to do some little little stuff here and there with with the image guys. He's going to ink a piece here. He's going to do a pinup there. But in 1993, that's going to be the time when he makes his image comic. Clearly never happened, but in 1993, he did Sax and Violins, written by uh, Peter David for Epic Comics. And, uh, you know, did he make the right call? You be the judge. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, were you a big George Perez fan? I, I grabbed everything George Perez that I could find on the strength of the interviews that the Image guys gave. And when they would talk about their influences and they would say John Byrne and George Perez... I had to pick up his comics, and you know what? I thought they were uh, just fine, but as as I've grown, I I don't look at them much at all. Yeah, I would say his strength, from my limited perspective, because I was not a big George Perez guy. I, I think I came in maybe after he had. Uh, I, I didn't read Teen Titans, which I guess would have been one of his some, premier books. Some of my favorite work of his is is in that for sure. And uh, and then you know like crossovers, he would do those like Crisis on Infinite Earth is probably one that he's known for. 
but known for being able to draw like these huge, just every character. A thousand characters on a, on a 25 panel page. Right. <laughs> yeah, so running through some of these books, Larson describes Dragon as about big guys who kick the shit out of each other. Love that book. Uh, you know, Liefeld, Youngblood is government strike force, uh, super celebrities with PR people. And then uh, Brigade is mentioned. Um, Wildcats, corporate superheroes. There's a lot of like balancing them against each other. So, you know, government is Youngblood and Rob Liefeld. Wildcats is corporate. Cyber Force is military. S suggesting that, it, that these comics are all a part of the same universe. And whenever Liefeld will mention something about Youngblood, then Jim Lee will pop in and say, okay, like with that, with that restriction in mind now, like my, you know, my comic will have this and this. Not, not to mention the fact that that they have dueling ginger leaders. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the only things they have in common. Jim Lee, Silvestri, and Valentino all have fast characters. <laughs> the way Silvestri describes his fast his character... is the fastest. Right. Could go about 2,000 miles per hour. You but can't the, even see his character. <laughs> they're so fast. But but the problem with running at that speed is if you run into, say, a housefly, it'll shatter your skull. <laughs> so that's where Cyberforce comes in because they take these mutants who um, have certain abilities and then they use cybernetics to beef them up for, for, uh, for, for action. The interviewer at Wizard is asking... You know, who's who's all going to be writing their own stuff? And Liefeld makes uh, the comment that the anonymous letter writer from, from uh, Comic Buyer's Guide might be in this very room. So this is before Eric Larson was outed as, as name withheld in the, uh, in the legendary Comic Buyer's Guide letters where he stated that, you know, people read comics for the art. It's, uh, it's, um, writers have an easier time. Like, uh, the, the stars of comics or the people who draw them. And, uh, Peter David, uh, took umbrage with that writing his own column in, in those issues. Uh, but I digress, I believe was the, the title. That is all correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Starting a bit of a feud between, uh, Peter David and, and some of the image founders. I like these early takes that, the the founding fathers are giving us um into their comics especially mcfarland talking about the origins of spider of, of spawn where he begins by saying i don't want to give too much away and then he basically gives a pretty solid synopsis with the only difference being that you know in the comic he comes back as like that meatball face uh but in this early in this early uh, article he's talking about Sp Spawn is, is, you know, Al Simmons, a black man to begin with, dies, makes a deal with the devil and comes back, dun dun dun, as a white man. <laughs> Smart move not uh, going that direction, even though there is that one early comic where he, he shows up as like a, a, a blonde hair guy for like two seconds and then that gets dismissed immediately. wonder if he got slack for that or just lost interest in that concept. He, he talks a lot about Spawn being, having finite amount of power. And in the beginning, you know, he had that counter and he talks about how he's going to die. He's not, you know, whatever. And like that just fades away as well. <laughs> I think in this interview, I think that Eric Larson invents the counter because he asks Todd McFarlane, so is there going to be some sort of uh, hourglass, some sort of counter? And then like a little later, like Todd is like, and then there's going to be a counter. So I, I don't know that that idea was necessarily in his head when he was suggesting talking about at the beginning, he just described it as like cash. Like you have a hundred bucks and you know, you could, you could destroy the earth if you wanted to, but then, you know, that's going to take the rest of your power. So you have to be cheap. You have to be cheap with your power. Yeah. He gives some funny examples, but you know, the summaries for their books, considering most of these books probably haven't even been started yet or in the very early stages, the summaries are pretty good. You know, Every comic show I've ever done, you, you'll see a book or you'll ask somebody, hey, what's this about? And people just mumble and look down and never give any kind of description. Learn from this. Like, please, you know, be able to describe your book in a sentence or two. It's very helpful to me trying to figure out if this is something I want to pick up or not. Yeah, I mean, these guys, consummate professionals, they, 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 they know what they're doing. And, and in fact, the, the way their comics work it all harkens back to work that they've done, um, the work that they, they're sort of known for at Marvel. So, so Liefeld doing Youngblood is kind of an X-Force-ish 
uh, comic. Wildcats is close to an X-Men comic as you could get, and that was what Jim Lee was known for. Same thing with Sylvester. And, and these guys admit it. What did, what did uh, McFarlane get popular on? Spider-Man. So it's not quite Spider-Man, but some of those poses and, and, and you know some of that detail in that, in that face mask kind of harkens back to that. Savage Dragon is the comic that, that Larson was like meant to draw. You know, I think Dragon goes back to his childhood. Dragon was previously invented when, when, when he was a kid. Spawn was invented by McFarlane when he was 16. Cyberforce is some new stuff where it make hay while the sun's shining. Wildcats was a comic that Jim Lee and Brandon Choi put together before he broke in. It was called Wild Boys. And Youngblood, in an earlier episode, we saw a solicitation for a mm-hmm. Youngblood comic in 1987. Right. So these these comics ideas were, were, were lingering in, in the creators' minds for many years before they inev- inevitably put pencil to paper. Yeah, and you mentioned professional, so I'll say a word about monthly and scheduling and all of that. You know, they talk about staggering how these books are being released so that they will have that presence and they're not necessarily competing with each other. They're, they all start out planned as miniseries with the exception of Spawn, but the interviewer asks them about the monthly schedule, which I think is interesting because the narrative that will come out of Image is that they're always late and you know, can't produce books on time. But all of these guys stress that they've been working monthly books for you know five years or something. It is something they're conscious of. And I'm, in, I'm impressed by you know, having some experience now as a professional, how time consuming it is to produce you know, pencils, inks, colors, you know, to, to handle the production of an entire book. There's a lot of hidden time in that production. And that's what these guys are taking on. And they do seem to be coming from a professional standpoint, at least to some degree. You know, I mean, look, they're they're jumping into the deep end in a lot of ways here. And I'm sure there are problems that come up that are unanticipated. But they're certainly at this point trying to apply what experience they have to this kind of production and work. And yeah, working on books that are similar to the books that made their names. Of course. Why wouldn't you do that? You're taking a big chance here. McFarland talks about how... They're going to do these three issue miniseries, and if they connect with the audience, they'll keep they'll keep it going. Uh, but Todd specifically states that if if Spawn doesn't connect, I'm going to try another idea. I have a thousand characters that I want to try, and I'm going to keep keep at it until until I come up with something that connects with the public. Going back to what you were saying about the um, professionalism, in as much as how they were going to be putting these books out and and addressing those issues. Silvestri has a direct quote. Uh, We won't just do two books and disappear for months. We're going to be dependable. Our books will be monthly. Yeah, everything doesn't go uh, quite as smoothly as planned, but again, they were thinking about this stuff, you know, and that's part of why they work with Malibu to start with. And, and, you know, we'll probably get into a little more detail on that, but a couple things that they, they have in the cooker with with image and with all these new properties that they now own from the very beginning they're talking about doing some crossover work with perhaps dark horse and mirage and they even allude to uh to possibly doing something uh with with valiant uh down the line which will inevitably be the death mate series of books they name even uh x-force youngblood crossover which years later would come to be so they do make a point of, you know, they're, they're not looking for... McFarlane uses the word vindication, and I don't know if he means vindictive <laughs> or vindication because it, it kind of works either way, but it doesn't seem like they have ill will towards Marvel. Many of them point out that they've had a good relationship with Marvel. They just want to own and control their own characters and the material they're writing, which standard standard publishing outside of the comics industry. Todd is mentioning working on licensing deals and... Toy deals are potentially yes. in the works. Todd McFarlane also wants to make it very clear that Image Comics is a creator-owned company, and they're kind of soliciting Malibu's expertise in all that background work that you mentioned on the previous episode: distribution, marketing, printing, printing, like like all of those things that, at this early stage, will give them the the ability to stay creative for like maybe say 75 percent of the process there are projections about how how much young blood is going to sell um dave uh Ulbrich, mm-hmm. he guarantees that 
Youngblood one will at least sell over three hundred seventeen thousand copies. Like like they they have they have that number down already. Goes on to do and and if it did three hundred seventeen, it would be the number one selling uh, independent comic ever published. They ultimately went on to go at about eight hundred thousand for Youngblood. I think Spawn did even more. I think yeah, it did a million. I believe so. And Liefeld talks about uh, wishing that he could continue doing X Force and Youngblood together, but that he's he's going to like lean more towards the independent. With with the gun to his head, he's going to lean more towards doing the independent thing right now. He also doesn't dismiss doing Marvel work in the future. No, and one of the projects I was super psyched for at the time was Cable. He was supposed to be doing a Cable series. Cable was this mysterious character, you know, one of the hottest characters at the time. And we're going to find out in the news section the fate of that series. Uh, one of one of the highlights for me is, uh, and a lot of coverage, this article stretches over about 10 pages. They ask, um, where do you see this in two years? You know, what do you see? They ask all, all, all of them. Silvestri's answer is, damn, I can't believe it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> um, I guess self-effacing. You know, it's hard to project how that actually came out in the room, and, and I could see that being a joking around with your buddies. And it is his beachfront front Malibu home, so yeah, like, okay. no matter what happens, he's going to be all right. <laughs> um, you know, McFarlane mentions mass market. Again, going back to the editorial, going back to what we were saying about the direct market being kind of cut off and how do you get new readers, McFarlane's already on that page, thinking like an entrepreneur, as you pointed out, Ed. And, you know, one of the things that comes out, stands out to me, is that attitude of his. Every Everything that we've seen from him so far in Wizard coverage has sort of been that. You know, like he seems to be very... Uh, has a long point of view on all of this stuff, you know, the long game as it is. And it works out that way. He's been tremendously successful, one of the most successful of this group. Liefeld says Youngblood movie. You know, he's always been uh, into Hollywood. Um, Have you seen the new Youngblood film? Was, was <laughs> Liefeld's answer to that statement. Valentino, more creators standing shoulder to shoulder. Part of the vision that Image represents. I mean, look, I'm one of those creators now standing shoulder to shoulder, right? When Valentino becomes publisher of Image Comics, that's when that's when that company did the about face and started publishing other people. And that's that's when Walking Dead happened. And I believe one of the earliest uh, other books that weren't from the top seven guys was uh, Little Gray Men by C. Scott Morse. You remember that? Um, so it's interesting to me to see these guys kind of dreaming. Because it is so unknown, you know, like Youngblood 1 may not have even been out yet at the time of this interview. So it, it it's wasn't. all just like, hey, what do you think, guys? How could this adventure go? But they are kind of hedging their bets, like keeping, burning no bridges. Yeah, and I think that their answers probably change over time, too, because they ask. So this this column, this smaller portion, are some of the Malibu guys talking about what their role is, what they're doing specifically. And Wizard asks them what the response has been. And it's mostly positive. The only grousing was from the creative community. How much, you know, how, how mad are you if you're one of these guys? You, you quit your job or you're fired because you've chosen to go out and take this chance on a book that's not paying you up front, that's, that has no guaranteed anything sales wise. You're doing everything yourself. You're laying the groundwork for this thing, probably at the risk to your, your, your home, your family, you know, your future. And then, like another guy, another another artist is going to criticize you for this, like that. Like that is a very shocking thing that I discovered getting into the comic book game, um, meeting meeting working professionals who who um, who see themselves as employees of these big companies. When last time I checked, the forms I got to fill out and, and send in to the government are 1099 forms. Man, I don't have a W two or whatever the fuck a, a working person has. Man, I have to pay my own health insurance. I have to uh, pay a self employment tax. They ain't doing you no favors. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's disappointing, but there are naysayers in everything, and you know we've met plenty of those in comics too. And it's just like these these. It, it doesn't matter what you would present; they're gonna come back with the no, the negative, the why it won't work, yeah. the why bother, and Maybe it's inevitable, but I, I would be very frustrated by that if I were the one that's putting my neck on the line and then some guy that I'm buddies with is, is bad-mouthing that. Yeah, I'm sure they're not buddies with them, but uh, I, know, I dig what you you're know saying. What, a, a, co a colleague, a peer. McFarlane talks about, in reference to the Malibu stuff, you just have a, a finite amount of time. 
you know, that's that's why you work with these Malibu guys, because, you know, if you're doing it yourself, then your book is bi-monthly, maybe. Um, you know, so you have a finite amount of time, find these people who are capable. When they talk about, you know, they went to other companies, Kamiko, Tundra, they, they dropped Nay Epic. They talked to all these companies about, I guess, the deal that they wanted and what they wanted from this partnership. And, uh, you know, Malibu seemed to be the, the the company they were happiest with. Yeah, they, they cite the sales force as being one of the game changers for them and why they chose why they chose Malibu uh, to, to go with ultimately. And, you know, probably their strategic position in Cali had something to do with it too, too especially with some of the, the big ideas that, that the, the image guys had for the future, Hollywood, stuff like that. Yeah, and I, you know, we've mentioned Tundra several times now. Kevin Eastman, the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles co-creator, his company, very awesome from a creative standpoint but not as good on the business side, right? I mean, like, they run into all sorts of trouble, uh, you know, going forward, and we'll get into their story and future issues, but it, that is the consideration when you're picking who are you going to work with, and it is the company that has the professional sales force, has a little bit of a track record and history. McFarlane, uh, you know, I have him quoted, one of the reasons behind Image uh, is a moral stance. You know, the, the image guys are not the guys who invented creator rights or, or started the creator right conversation in comics. They were the guys that I first heard really talking about it. You know, so as you say, they, they, they were definitely pioneers, at least to our generation. And, and there were guys that came before them that had these same talks and they mentioned them. You know, they mentioned Kirby and Gil Kane and Neil Adams. All these guys left and did their own thing, but they didn't necessarily leave together. They weren't you know, they weren't organized or they weren't at the very top of their, you know, when their name meant the most or sold the most comics. Um, but I was reading these interviews when they were talking about X-Force or Spider-Man. So whenever they decide to start talking about owning their own characters, I'm still reading the interviews. And now it's a different conversation, different I new ideas for me. Again, not the origin of these ideas, but for me, it was the first time that I was really like, oh, yeah, you could do this. Like you could have you could do it yourself. That was big. Huge. And, and, and just the way that that company works nowadays, uh, there isn't really a better, like if you make a successful project for Image, you can't get a better deal almost anywhere else. Like if you were a musician, you wouldn't get this deal right. with a record company that, that Image presents with, to, to the people who make comics for them. It's very cool. It's, it, it still feels like an experiment. And that's, I kind of love that. So we, we just spent... Uh probably half an hour on the image founders. And the reason that, that we praise image and these guys is they took a chance. They put creators first themselves. You know, they did it for personal gain. You know, I don't have to deify these guys or say they're better than they are, but now we're going to read about valiant founders. So this interview is with Steve Masarski, Seymour Miles and John Hartz from Voyager communications, uh, valiant, valiant comics. And you're going to see the flip side. These are kind of like the founders of this company that's built on the same model as Marvel Comics, where Valiant, the company, owns all of the intellectual property and basically uses the talent, the artist, as freelancers. Uh, same model as Marvel, DC, opposite of Image. You know, the reason that I look at the Image guys and praise them is because they left this, this model that was very, very successful. The guy sells 8 million comics what is a royalty check for 8 million comics? And he leaves that, you know, when he did not have to, when he could have kept cashing those checks. He leaves that to try to own the stuff that he's making. That's why we are, you know, praising image because as creators, we want to be able to own what we create. And this is the reason why. So this is an interview with these guys. I don't know if they're the money guys, the owners, the founders, or whatever behind Valiant Comics. And you'll see a very different point of view as we go through this interview. The, this era was great for the people at the top of the game. But if you were like a journeyman worker, the company that you're working for is making the bulk of the money and they are going to wear you down to a nub to try to squeeze every bit of work out of you that they, that they can. Yeah, and I don't want to spend too much time on this interview because quite honestly, I think most of what these guys are saying in here is not... Um, we're not we're not really seeing behind the curtain in terms of the business side. You know what they are experts at, what they're actually doing is not what we're getting into. They talk about creating these books. Their names aren't in the credits. I, I 
it rubs me so wrong <laughs> that they'll sit there and talk about, you know, creating these books and creating these characters. Telling somebody to reference Methuselah is not the same <laughs> as creating a comic book. It just isn't. Okay, do that and then add, you know, 4,000 man hours and you'll have a comic book. And, and uh, Mazarski, Mazarski, like, trumpets the fact that they work Bob Layton from 9 a.m. until 11 every single day. That's 11 p.m. every single day. Yeah, I pulled a couple of quotes from this whole thing. That's one of them. The other one is the interviewer asks about about Bob Layton doing any more Iron Man. That's where he sort of built his reputation. Their answer, and I quote, Yes, perfect. There's no way we're going to let Bob go and do any Iron Man. You have to look at these contracts that you sign. You know, to any cartoonist out there, is this the person that you want to work for and do you want to give them that kind of control over your life? Who talks this way about another person? You know, and a person who is making them money and who is working 15-hour days, I'm sure at a sacrifice of his personal life, and, and he gets nothing except a measly page rate paycheck, and then this is how you're spoken of publicly? Right. It's absolutely disgusting. How does Valiant come up with their ideas? Oh, by committee, you know, we have uh, 15 to 20 guys. We just all, uh, we all put in our two cents. We all add to the pot, and then we give it to Bob and uh, Jim to turn into a comic. Yeah, to spend 15 hours a day turning into something we can then cash in on. Um, I, I love the, uh, yeah, that was my quote, another one of the quotes. A lot of creative process done by group decisions, which is great. You know, the, <laughs> the one strength I always tout about comics is that one person can do it. You can get this unique vision that you cannot get in things like film or animation. But, of course, if you're unable to write or draw, you need the group decision. That's the only way you get any input. But listen, um, man, Mazorski, he was a music lawyer, right? So, and Shadow Man is like a New Orleans musician. So his big contribution is Dickie Betts and the Allman Brothers are going to appear in issue one and and be on the lookout because there might be more musician cameos in future issues. That is what I'm looking for in a good comic, <laughs> for sure. Um, and, 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 and in case you're not sure about they're coming from a music background and maybe don't know anything about making comics. Hartz removes all doubt whenever he says, well, most well, of the guys up here don't read comics. <laughs> all right. Then goes on to say, well, we go to the comic shop every weekend and we take a look and we, we try to see what looks the best on the racks. Like we each go with $20 and we come back with stacks and then we take them back to the Voyager offices and we reverse engineer them to try to uh, see what works, see what doesn't. If I was a kid with just this much money in my pocket, what would I buy? They, they bring them back on Monday and give them to Jim Shooter. <laughs> Imagine what's going through Jim Shooter. I've been making comics professionally since I was 13 years old. What's going through his head whenever this music guy hands him a comic and says, this is what we should be doing? Yeah, these <laughs> total schmucks. The reason this is rubbing Jim and I the wrong way is because We've we've dealt with skunks before. Like, you know, I didn't sign my name on the dotted line with this one company that, you know, was a very very famous, prominent guy in comics. Was like spearheading this this company, and it, frankly, it had the stink of like a valiant kind of thing. And they laid out all these licensed properties that they were going to be working on. Now, this is before my hip hop comic like really really hit. It was out, but. The printings were selling out, so it's like the money tap was turned off for Eddie P for a little while, and I was taking taking uh, offers. These guys, you know, they kiss your butt to start, and they they try to butter you up. But I'm a Pittsburgh boy, man. Like you can't you can't play me that way, man. Like my my streetwise is is dope. You know what I'm saying? You're not gonna turn me into a bitch. They send me uh, the contract, and I take a look at the particulars, and they had. A, a specific panel requirement per page. No fewer than six panels a page. And I told these guys to fuck the fuck off. Why can't there ever be, like, two cool comic companies? You know what I'm saying? Like, before when it's like Marvel's the cool one and then DC are the squares. That was the same deal with, with this era, man. Like, like the image dudes were renegades and they were cool. And then this corporate, like, you know, these stuffy Valiant comics. I've said uh, uh, several times... Valiant and Image to me are like the Alpha and Omega of 80s Marvel. And, you know, a lot of that is because of Jim Shooter. When he leaves, the Image guys just break all the rules that he established. And he never said six panels per page, but he was famous for having those types of rules. You know, this is how to make comics the Marvel way. 
image went off as soon as he left and just went nuts and and cells exploded and fandom you know everything he goes and forms valiant and it's that same stodgy like okay this is how we do it by the book this is how you make comics and even in terms of the the contracts right the the corporate owns everything like it really is that like this is old comics all right and this is about the peak of Valiant creatively. This is right around the time of Unity. Jim Shooter's going to be gone. Probably we'll read about it in next next issue or the one after that. You know, he doesn't last much longer. And you'll see, they start putting out things like hardcore. Yeah. You know, like just garbage. But at that point, there's momentum. Like they're selling those books, you know. They're... Here's another good quote. Yes, we're always talking about trading cards. Good. Go get in the trading card business. <laughs> I'm surprised that they would come out and speak this way publicly. It's just that thing. Like they, they just are blissfully unaware of even what they're saying. It's like, it's like, I remember going to, um, to, to a festival that shall remain nameless where, 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 um, a famous comedian gets on the microphone and he's, he's, uh, First off, talking about the genre of, of comics. So like comics as a genre, which, which always grates on me. Yeah. But then he, you know, he said something like, you know, people are asking, why, why am I hosting this? And, and then he went in to tell this whole story about how, how he had had an idea for a movie script that didn't quite land, but he then thought that it would be, uh, it would work as a, as a graphic novel. And like, you know, that story that you've heard a thousand times. And he was just making himself look like such a douchebag because he really is so ignorant to the culture of comics that he doesn't know that what he's telling us is not unique by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, it's it's a bad look. But the other piece I would add is these are not even editors. You know, when, when we're Strictly. criticizing this kind of disregard for talent for the creators, this happens everywhere. I mean, I'm sure this is, you know, every major publisher, whether it's Marvel, Disney, Time, whoever, it's a, it's a disconnect between the people that are keeping the books and that's probably the, the accountants let's say the purse strings the the, the bankers you know there, there's a major separation there between that and the editors you know i have lots of friends who are editors they do their best just like the cartoonists that are working in the system do their best but this kind of you know you're just we're just replaceable like we're we're not viewed that way you know i look at it and go this is my favorite artist i'm gonna follow them to whatever book they're doing that's not how it's viewed from the other side. Right. From the other side, it's like, hey, it's it's you know, it's whatever character and plug somebody on onto this book. Right. <laughs> I do love this issue of Wizard because this article and the image article are next to each other. I totally. mean, it is really a different view. And this article is the reason that a company like Image is championed. Let's get off these schmucks. Yes. I feel like I have to go like wash my hands and stuff now. <laughs> The New Toys, 1992 Toy Fair Report. I don't have a ton here. There's 50 new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle figures planned for this year. Amazing. There's a, an X-Force line of toys. So again, this is Rob Liefeld, right? He has no control over that X-Force line of toys. That's going to happen with or without his consent. Part of the reason that you want to own this stuff and be responsible. You know your homeboy Ed was a big mark for that <laughs> shit, boy. Right at that time, too, man. I was grabbing them all. Giddy, I even had Gideon, man. <laughs> Gideon. <laughs> That's amazing. Gideon got a figure. Everybody got a figure, man. Dude. GW Bridge. Wow. Has a figure. And he's not blue like issue four. <laughs> I dropped my cable over there and I'm not going to pick it up. You'll just have to trust me. Yeah, so the, my favorite part of this article when I'm reading it was just thinking, I wish Brian Cunningham was there. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> Fish Police. That's that's a that's a uh, a, a comic mm -hmm. that um, got optioned and and saw a lot of success. I mean, one of you know, it's sort of a, a Zen like success where it was crammed down our throats and nobody quite bit, but the creators did well for themselves. I believe it was was it a Kamiko comic? I'm not sure who published it. I actually just filed that comic recently, the first issue of it. I think it jumped around for a little bit. Yeah, I bit. think Malibu at some point probably had a, a little bit of it. And to root this in a time period as well the toys were being uh showed off for for the uh the james bond jr animated series which i was actually a giant fan of i watched that before i watched any of the movies and i wondered why the movies were boring compared to uh the the cartoon where odd job is dressed like a b-boy man he's dressed like heavy d <laughs> 
And he has like a Kango hat, like Run DMC that he throws. He's got like a dookie rope chain and shit from what I remember. Oh, what is this? Also, don't miss Brian Cunningham's review of the new superhero figures introduced at the New York Toy Fair. It's, hard, it's hard not to jump right to page 61. <laughs> Your dreams came true. <laughs> All right, another big feature on Neil Gaiman, The Master of Dreams, Lost Loves, Old Gods, and Unanswered Riddles. So Gaiman grew up a comics fan. American comics, uh, particularly, he knew Alan Moore's work from 2000 AD. DR and Quinch, Halo Jones, a couple other things here and there, some of the more memorable future shocks to begin with. And then in about 1984, he saw Alan Moore's name, the 2000 AD guy's name, on a Swamp Thing comic. So somebody from the UK scene penetrates DC Comics. And at the time, this is when... Gaiman did, in fact, write his Duran Duran biography that he sent to Alan Moore as just kind of like a, hi, I'm a big fan. And it was his way to get a conversation going with Moore so that he can figure out how the heck do you get into the American comics game. And Alan Moore showed him what a comic script looked like first off, helped shepherd him into the comics game by uh, giving him the opportunity to work on Miracle Man uh, after Moore left, uh, Neil Gaiman took that ball and ran with it. Karen Berger got in touch. He did. He and uh, David McKean did the Black Orchid uh, three-issue miniseries. And after that, he submitted an eight-issue pitch, an eight-part pitch for 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 a Sandman comic, Morpheus. His idea was to kind of flip the whole script, kind of like what Alan Moore did. On Swamp Thing, he mentions you know it, it's not any one genre, which I respond to as uh, you know as a fan of his writing of Sandman and also the work that I aspire to make. You know, I like that kind of freedom, and it's interesting to me that he has vision. You know, like more and more, I think that vision is one of those really important components to to success. You know, you can sort of work it as a nine to five job, or you can have this idea that almost defies description. And in a way, that's Sandman. And that's what you see with a very creative mind like Gaiman's, you know, that, that goes beyond Sandman. But at this point, you know, it's sort of early in, in in his fantasy writing career. But you already see that giant ideas are there from the very beginning. At this point, just recently would have won the World Fantasy Award for Best Short Story for issue 19 of Sandman, the, the uh, Midsummer's Night's Dream that was drawn by Charles Vess. Mm -hmm. Well, the rumor is that they changed the rules so that comics cannot be a part of it. And they stated, no, that is not what we did. Um, he was never supposed to be able to be nominated for the award that he was nominated for. But there is an award called the Special Award, the Special Award Professional category. And it's perfectly fine and acceptable for comic books to be nominated in that category. In the entire history of that award, uh, a cartoonist in a comic book has never even been nominated. So take take what you, you will from that. Somewhere in here, he's asked uh, about the difference between uh, British comics writers and American comics writers. And he states that the way the Brits look at comics is just another story media, like another vessel to tell stories whereby most American comics writers, certainly the enhancement talent of, of the day, are comic fans, comic readers, the bulk of what they kind of ingest is comics and what they regurgitate is facsimile, right. you know, Xerox copy of a Xerox copy type comic story. Another thing that I would always see pros recommend is that you find influences outside of comics, right? So many cartoonists learn to draw comics from copying comics. So many comics writers learn to write from reading comics and uh, professionals will tell you to be more broad. And he's just basically saying that, that's what he's seeing with British writers is that they do have a wider set of influences and interests outside of comics. One of the questions that Gaiman often gets asked and he's asked in, in this, in this piece is um, does Sandman and the Endless fit into the wider DC superhero comics universe? And, and he says that, yeah, in some tangential way, like uh, he, he has a very florid way to describe how, how um, Sandman does fit into DC Comics, like Batman exists in his world, but you know it's a it's a stretch to get there. And he would inject little bits here and there of of DC heroes. Um, 
Element Girl, who was like a female metamorpho. Um, I believe you got to see what Dream looks like to a Martian Manhunter's race. And here he talks about wanting to put the Bizarros mm -hmm. into uh, the Sandman series. And he wrote them as such, sent the script off, and some people in DC editorial, beyond Karen Berger, decided that that was a no-go. You can't be using our our beloved bizarros <laughs> which were written out of continuity right, right. at that point after after crisis and after uh john byrne did, did what he did <laughs> so they called them uh what did they call weirdos them? weirdos and colored them <laughs> weird and instead of putting a uh s on his chest a backwards s on his chest it's a big h for for hyperman so just like those little things and it reminded me of uh several of the several top-notch cartoonists that i know that have that have gone over and done some work for, for DC. Like they were, they were cherry picked specifically because of their interesting cartooning and asked, what would you do? Like, what would you like to do? What kind of story would you do? And almost everything that they chose was, um, co-opted by some other editor on some other book. Like they couldn't just let these people right. make the comic that they wanted to make. That seems to be the culture of that company. Very conservative. Yeah. You know, describing the endless, he mentions uh, dysfunctional families and that they're often described as dysfunctional families. And he says that uh, that's just what we used to call families. <laughs> and I think that's fantastic. I often think that we have this idea of normal or what's expected and it's completely a construct of like advertising models or something. <laughs> this ideal that nobody actually ever reaches. So we can always, always feel bad about, you know, our own shortcomings. Um, but it was neat to see him say that, and again, very eloquent compared to the way I would describe everything. <laughs> yeah, he's a real writer. But, you know, and, and he mentions that was a quote I pulled out as real people. You know, it's hard to it's hard to um, describe how impactful Sandman was. I think a lot of times whenever a pivotal cultural touchstone appears, everything after it is influenced by it. And if you don't come to it at that time... It sort of doesn't, it's hard to see like how big it is because everything after it has a piece of it in there. You know, it diminishes the impact. And Sandman was one of those books, like, think about what we spent an hour talking about, Image doing cyber force and it's military, <laughs> you know, mutants with helmets so they can run into flies at high speed. And then it's Valiant and it's, you know, Magnus fighting robots and Solar. And then it's this where he's talking about a, a family, you know, that exists at all times, essentially, really defies genre as fantasy. And it still comes down to like real people, real relationships, and this idea of a reality despite the, the, the trappings of fantasy, but a reality in terms of character and the way they're depicted in a way that you're not getting anywhere else in this magazine or anywhere else on the, on the comics newsstand. And now it's very normal. You know, you see graphic novels that tackle this kind of depth, um, humanity, but back then there really wasn't anything. And this issue doesn't even have Palmer's picks. So like, we're really like out on a limb, <laughs> but there wasn't anything like Sandman before it. And there was a lot of stuff that was influenced by it afterwards. There will be a part later where we were covering some of the new hot books, um, where, you know, John Byrne is saying that his, his North star character in alpha flight one Oh six, he always intended the character to be gay. And not only that, but I was going to make him die of AIDS. Right, right, exactly. That, like, that's the vocabulary of, like, yes. the other guys. What you're describing is where that real people quote comes from. Right. You know, it's... And, and it's funny because the interviewer asks him specifically about, are these real people we're dealing with? And he describes them as ideas, which is even more interesting to me. Because we strive to write real care, you know, real people and, and real-like characters. And he's achieving that, but he's even thinking beyond that. You know, these are personifications of these bigger ideas that he's playing with. It's amazing. It's it's amazing what he's done. One thing that stood out to me is he, he talks about the, I don't want to call it a grind, but he kind of talks about the reality of producing a work of this scale on a monthly basis. And and that the monthly schedule is tough. Like, the, you know, he probably won't do another monthly book. Um, he's spending two to three weeks and writing 10,000 to 15,000 words per script. For Sandman. For, for Per issue, right, yeah. Which, and then he does whatever else he's doing on the side, you know, around that. So the other week or two weeks a month, um, it's, it's incredible. You know, think of these guys that are writing five or six books a month and you realize they're not doing what Neil Gaiman was doing. It requires so much energy to produce a comic 
the idea to do it in a dashed off way so that what you save yourself a week or something like why do that like go go make your money some other way it is yeah there's way easier opportunities to make a dollar for sure man so they ask him uh anything else uh, planned over at dc and he mentions uh, a collaboration that never happened but sounds fucking exquisite uh he and Simon, Simon Bisley have some some ideas, some stuff that they want to work on together. But to date here and for the rest of uh, history so far, um, they can never get their schedules to to uh, to align with one another so that they could like make this this thing happen. Whenever it was about to happen, uh, Bisley got the, the the Batman Judge Dredd story. Yeah, and it's the the story he describes is Batman goes to the circus. <laughs> I want that book so bad. <laughs> it it kind of it kind of made me sad reading this because I, I I had not read this article before uh, this week in preparation, and I had not seen that story described. And it's like I'm a little bit sad to know it it just is never happening. <laughs> well, never say never because. Uh, some, somewhere in this article, he's talking about um, writing a second draft for, for a Good Omens uh, screenplay. And this is 1992, and it's now 2018, and that is that Good Omens project is now going to be seen as a six-part serial on Amazon Prime. So maybe it'll just take 30 <laughs> years. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, so after everything that Jim so eloquently described about what... Gaiman is gaining recognition for with Sandman by writing something that's kind of beyond what we would think of as a typical superhero comic. He said that he heard uh, through the grapevine from somebody over at Marvel Comics, one of their hit titles, Sleepwalker, is quote-unquote, Sandman done right. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he said that, uh, you know, he thought that that was really, really cute. <laughs> and uh, that, you know, that Sandman, I mean, that Sleepwalker, like, goes into people's dreams and has battles and gets to meet Spider-Man, <laughs> but, but his comic will never be that. <laughs> Another big question that he receives a lot, that seems to be what this article is. He's kind of addressing the, it's almost like an FAQ. How long are you going to be writing Sandman comics? And is it going to continue when, when you're finished with, with your tour of, of duty? And Gaiman is gangster because he strongly suggested that that they don't continue um, putting out these Sandman comics. And when he first came to editorial, Karen Berger, Dick Giordano, you know, the powers that be, they were really skittish about that idea. Then he starts producing the comic and they start to become more at ease with that idea that this is something that, that, that shouldn't be messed with. And wisely Gaiman would always dangle the carrot that you know I simply will never do a comic for you again if somebody picks this comic up after me and every couple of years he'll do a DC comic so he doesn't give he doesn't give a an issue number to when he's going to wrap up Sandman because he states that then the headline becomes you know Sandman to end with issue 45 or or whatever so he's he doesn't he doesn't pin a number on when the last issue of Sandman will come out, but he does say that he has three big stories that he wants to tell, maybe a few singular ones, and and then that and then that'll be it. So then they ask him towards the end, uh, "What will you do with your time?" And and he he says that ideally, what he would like to do is spend maybe six months a year working on comics, and then another six months doing anything else, maybe writing a novel here or there, maybe a screenplay. So, you know, he seemed to make good on, on his on his projections, even though he's definitely pushed way further on, on doing singular work, which, you know, just as well, my hat's off to the guy, because when you're in a collaboration, even if it's an ideal situation and you have, like, the perfect artist to work with, it's still not going to be what you see in your, in your head. Um... So, you know, just as, as a singular creator, it's, it's, it's good to, you know, produce some work that is 100% your vision, uncompromised. He describes writing the experience of writing the Good Omens screenplay, and that really puts him off of at least adapting his own work. Uh, he describes it as, you know, you're, you're trying to tell the story in 100 minutes, and you, this is his quote, 
look at Sandman and think, would I really enjoy barbecuing my own baby? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I think that's kind of funny. He, you know, he, he describes it as, uh, you know, drive the pickup to California, pile the money in and drive back. <laughs> And and uh, you know he and because he says that like you know if you're going to make something for film that that's your that's your own that you need to have as much creative control as possible you need to direct it do all that sort of stuff and I believe he is going to be the showrunner for the American Gods uh, series from now on and and the television landscape is different where you can do more serialized like novelistic uh, forms of storytelling that was far departure from from anything that was going on in television in 1992 sneak peek of next month's cover with Rob Liefeld drawing Cable for the last time in a while yeah and and Shaft from Youngblood we won't linger on this too much because that's a 200 page issue so that'll be a big episode (laughs) so talking about articles that I don't care about (laughs) one I'm a comics fan and I'm a movies fan but for some reason the comics adapted to movies almost never work right um, if they're good enough to to have somebody throw tens of millions of dollars at them for the movie, they're probably a really good comic. Read the comic, enjoy the comic. Um, this is another one of those articles by Andy Mangles. It's, this is not even a Batman Returns movie review. This is a <laughs> who's in it. You know, we, a couple of issues ago, we had the review of a screenplay that wasn't used. <laughs> and now we're going back through and just looking at who's in it and who's not in it. He's constantly referencing newspapers. What are all these newspapers that are writing about this? You know, it, it's it's ludicrous. <laughs> these articles, they're so strange. Moving along, the very first Brutes and Babes feature, which was which is an important staple of Wizard Magazine for, for a very long time, usually spearheaded by uh, Bart Sears. But here we have this flock of seagulls looking guy <laughs> Named Paul Mounts. My, my note is he looks like Dave Mustaine from Megadeth. <laughs> so we have Paul Mounts here talking about color. He colored the, the first couple, three, three Marvel Universe series of, of trading cards. He colored the Jim Lee set of trading cards. One thing he says that I like is, I don't know if somebody's interviewing him or what, but he talks about materials to use. And he says, experiment with anything that will mark paper. Um, I like that, you know, like I that's, that's an attitude I believe now. And I think it's easier now with digital printing and scanning, you know, you can reproduce anything at this time. It's a little bit tougher, but uh, I think that's a great answer for somebody who's trying to, you know, figure out how to make something, how to draw, how to color. I think that's a pretty good spot on. And then, uh, just a word on his materials. He mentions that he's working on hot press, which is smooth surface, um, you know, cold press is rougher, a, a bigger tooth. So I haven't done any airbrushing. And primarily, that's what he's talking about and what he's using. It's one of those medium that, uh, I guess, rose to prominence in the 70s and 80s. Uh, you'd see it everywhere from, like, van art to, uh, you know, I mean, denim it, jackets. Yeah, this piece looks like, you know, the, the guy at Century 3 yes. Mall who has the t-shirt pagoda. And for 70 bucks, like, he'll be happy to, uh, you know, airbrush some gnarly stuff. I would always have, have friends that would uh, have an airbrush going. And, and it was it was pretty neat, but it did seem like a lot of learning curve. And, I just, and a lot of equipment necessary. You know, having an air compressor going, cleaning out the airbrush regularly, that was too much for me. So Agreed. He sort of got started using uh, using Doc Martin dyes, and, and that, sort of, that sort of jumped out at me because uh, that was something that we had to use at the, at the Kubert School. And, and one of the reasons why uh, it jumped out at me was he was talking about some of the hardest parts of his color process is coming up with a, with a flesh tone. So like when I was at the Kubert school, like here's a set of my set of Doc Martin dyes that are still they're still Super liquid cool, man. after uh, after you know 20, 20 years practically. Uh, this is this was the tool of choice for the standard Marvel DC colorists whenever they were providing guides for the color separator to then delineate the the actual color. And uh, I don't know if you've ever used this stuff, Mm-mm. but this shit is high octane, man. You. You you have one of these like little cup things, a palette. Mm-hmm. You fill it up with water, and I'm saying this, these are eyedroppers at the top of this. One drop will give you a, a sufficient wash. You know, one drop to like fifty drops of water. And when we were at the Kubert School, everybody took pride in coming up with their exact scientific recipe concoction for the perfect flesh yes. tone. 
two two cc's of magenta <laughs> to one cc of of uh burnt sienna burnt sienna to 50 drops of water and then people would buy like independent like, yes tubes to just like keep yep. their 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 flesh tone in there man uh but this stuff is not light fast these these dyes are not light fast they're like a candy bowl of color like they uh fade immediately and when you go to scan them expect that the color is five times brighter than what you originally in intended we did the uh the same thing in painting classes like the very first week would be like mixing up your palettes and flesh tone you know skin skin was the, the color that we would all get the notes on like this is what you mix and it would have greens in it and all these colors where it's like what how does this work but it would work right and uh and like the first pages of my sketchbooks would have those you know the various mixes and how to do this <laughs> and it was the same deal you know you'd mix up a bunch of it and then scrape it off your palette and you could save it that way if you were painting a bigger painting or whatever you didn't have the problem of trying to like mix it up halfway through and then match so same same process i guess the media is, doesn't really make a difference it's not much to speak of yeah, I don't have too much. I was surprised. Brutes and Babes is a column, I'm sure anyone familiar with Wizard, and especially somebody that was trying to make comics, remembers. But I'm, I'm surprised it's not Bart Sears starting this column off. I am too. I'm fine with this. I like color. It's interesting to read about for me personally. But, eh. We'll move along. It's also very involved. You know, to, to start your column with color, to me, is advanced. Like, I drew in black and white forever. Um, coloring was way above my, you know, where I was at skill set wise, despite thousands of hours of drawing and, and countless sketchbooks full of drawings. Um, color was pretty advanced. So, yeah, it's wizard trying things, you know, in this column, like everything else, it may take a couple of uh, a couple of, of uh, months to get it worked out. Comic Watch. First Forge, um, first Lockheed. Yeah, issue 166 of X-Men, first Lockheed. Issue 184 of X-Men is the first appearance of Forge when he has the Daisy Dukes in the, in the pimp cane. And then Amazing Spider-Man 265, first appearance of uh, Silver Sable, who gains more prominence in this, this era. You know, when McFarlane does a couple of Spider-Man comics with her, and then she'll be getting her solo book soon. So they're expecting these books to become worth a little bit more money yeah and this is all speculator stuff the silver sable book really doesn't catch on doesn't last long i don't think it's you know a success by any any measure so i don't know if her first appearance actually makes much difference but that's what this is you know that's what this column is is them just trying to they've got to put something in there they're not gonna have a blank month the amazing art showcase you know what i love is uh recently um people who had art in wizard magazine have got gotten in touch with us and if you've ever you know anybody in the audience if you've had art in uh in a, in a wizard magazine let us know and if you are one of the names that we'll be calling out put something in the comments and let us know how your how, how your art is coming along if you have any self-published comics or if you're you're in the game in some capacity let us know how you've been uh how you've been keeping up because i've been pleasantly surprised a lot of people have maintained comics careers and have been self-publishing and doing lots of stuff even though their names might not be on the tip of your tongue. So we have uh, Billy Lyons, Bergenfeld, uh, New Jersey, who did did an alien, you know, a, a xenomorph alien. Jennifer Postma of uh, Carlton Place, Ontario, Canada. I believe the first the first lady to have. I was going to say there aren't a lot of women uh, in in wizard art in these art contests yet. So yeah, doing Psylocke too. Jim Lee did like a three issue X Men with that care, you know, with that version of Psylocke, like reintroducing her. Um, probably my favorite Jim Lee X Men issues. Yeah. Really cool, like kind of darker stuff, ninja stuff, Wolverines in it. Brian White does a does a Venom cover. Timely. The Wizard guys mentioned that all of your names are going to be given to to Valiant Comics. So like Valiant sold themselves as being such a great company earlier, and if they like what they see. They might work you from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, and night. then take credit for it. <laughs> Aaron Klein does a badger, which I thought was pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, that's really awesome. Ken Berube of uh, Tingsboro. What's M.A.? Massachusetts? Massachusetts. <laughs> does Tick? My... What's Maine? M.E.? <laughs> We're the worst. <laughs> this isn't geography, uh, kayfabe. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's cool, the Tick. I like these indie indie characters. 
Ernesto Cruz, Puerto Rico, does a mask. One thing I'll call out here, a few of these guys have like some, uh, they add the little news he headlines. I like that part. So his is an interview with Doug Monk, the uh, artist of the mask. Glenn Rain, McKinleyville, California, does uh, Captain America. <laughs> Eric L. will say, uh, does does Lobo kind of wiping his taint <laughs> with uh, with the, the wizard get up. It's a good one. Very Lobo-like. Lobo sure. And uh, Daniel Rodriguez, Fort Worth, Texas, does... Wolverine? Oh, yeah. That's Wolverine. I could tell by the boots. Yeah, okay. It's like a it's like a Barry Windsor Smith-inspired Wolverine. A, a half-naked, a, a shirtless, hairy Wolverine. <laughs> Hairy-chested Wolverine. Hot news. Yes. Handle it. <laughs> <laughs> Hot news. My kind of hero is coming. So... Uh, they're soliciting for another, I guess the response to drawing covers has been so positive, they're now having uh, send in your own character creations. Heroes, villains, teams include a 200 word explanation of who these characters are, a profile. So this is an example of what they're looking for, you know, tell us a little bit about the character. And it's same same idea as the uh, covers, you know, they'll run the top ones, they'll send them off to Valiant. Whew, I just don't. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wonder if anybody got hooked up that way. Yeah, is that um, how Bloodshot got invented? Yeah, I wonder. <laughs> but uh, this goes on to be one of you know. This was a feature I really enjoyed was seeing like the the, I guess amateur created characters. That was big for me, and I was doing that kind of stuff too. I don't know if I, I can't remember if I actually sent them anything, but that was the stuff I would do. You know, is draw my own characters and make up whatever bullshit you know I could come up with. But this is the uh, I think a lot of guys you know, did this. And, you know, and it's kind of like role-playing games too. You know, you do it if you play Dungeons and Dragons or anything where you're making up your character and their story and very popular for cartoonists and aspiring cartoonists. My first wizard was, I believe, issue number 37. And, and this like creative character feature is not a part of that. No. Yeah, so so oh, I man. actually don't know about this. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. It, it runs for a little while, so it'll, we'll have some fun looking at those. Jim Rugg, Ask and Ye Shall Receive, the Toying Around article with our resident Pat Sajak. Brian Cunningham, and he asks the tough questions, man. This this month, he's asking, why are there no uh, female action figures? And this was something that he didn't want to touch with a 10-foot pool. I love Brian Cunningham's columns. <laughs> <laughs> he's such a character in my mind. I really come to enjoy these. Um, this topic, I can understand why he doesn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. Yes. Because one of the one of the things he says about it is, He's speculating about why there aren't a lot of female figures and that maybe there aren't a lot of collectors uh, that are girls. You know, it's it's mostly boys collecting boy figures. And that's where he sa sounds the most reasonable. Continue. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then he goes on to talk about his own experience with girl figures and says, female figures were the first to die in my little fantasies. <laughs> I don't know, Brian. That's not a good look. Remember the small Mego playset with the exploding bridge? <laughs> he says that. It's a funny topic, I suppose, for a column, and it's funny looking back and reading this, but it is a very, uh, this is definitely the boys club of uh, doll action figure collecting. Yeah, yeah. Like, we will circle back to the article after we discuss this list right here, which he does confirm is the list of action figures that that um, people want to see, like, like they're sort of dream action figures, if they could guess any. And taking it back to the article now, he said that one of the entries that somebody sent in <laughs> was that he would love if uh, if they made a Psylocke figure with removable clothing. And and uh, Cunningham's uh, response to that is, now there's a figure that would sell. Hubba hubba. Right. He also notes that not one voter in this co contest was female. Not surprised. <laughs> right. He does make it to the 1992 Toy Fair, so I, I was very happy to find out that my dream was answered here. Uh, and I was shocked to learn that he goes there with his assistant. He has an assistant. Amazing. What? And of course, they get uh, they get lost when they arrive. They also, uh, it was on the 10th floor of the building, so they take two flights of steps before they realize they are in horrifying shape. <laughs> And I uh, have to take the elevator. <laughs> and then it goes into exactly what you would expect. High level of excitement for all of these upcoming figure releases. Uh, some that we've already seen, like the X-Force line there. And then round it out with, uh, you know, flagship characters from the rest of the, the Marvel brand, including Deathlock. 
a lot of excitement <laughs> over Deathlock back then. I'm not sure that's carried carried on. He also uh, solicits letters. He does, yeah. Which, he... which we'll see after this, you know, after this uh, little break. There's the Whitman poster. That's pretty sweet. That's a good Venom. <laughs> I wondered who the colorist was, if it was possibly Paul Mounts, because it is airbrushed. Yeah, it's 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 not it, it's a uh, the name is the name is on the screen right now of the colorist. Cool. Um, so the letters about what you would expect. A lot of uh, he's he gets six, five or six pages this month, Brian Cunningham. So uh, the one letter that I would call attention to is this one from Bill uh, Merkline who is a longtime toy designer and he talks about specifically designing the Venom toy that Cunningham was uh, fell in love with a couple of issues ago. Uh, he talks about some of the other toys that he designed and that he had a very short amount of time to design them, not enough time in his opinion. And whenever he was dropping off a small Venom figure, he saw the other oversized figures, uh, Hulk and Spider-Man. He wasn't impressed with the sculpting, but thought the size would be great for Venom. And he told those guys that he'll sculpt Venom in this scale and it will outsell any of these figures. And the guys looked at his small Venom and said, he's right. Now, I'm not sure, but his name is familiar to me. And if it's the guy I'm thinking about, it is the guy. Mm -hmm. I've, I've done G.I. Joe's. Okay. In the show notes, there is going to be a link to like maybe a four or five part interview with him talking about the design and construction of the G.I. Joe action figures and it's fascinating. Like he's he's not he's not a professional broadcaster, so so give so give him some space. But he's a really interesting guy. He has a very long storied career, and uh, that that interview is pretty great. Frank Miller doing the Valiant characters. Wizard news. Now some of the news is just an elaboration of uh, some of the things that I think showed up in the in the Sam Keith issue number number six, I believe, where Marvel was is planning to do a you know the spirits of vengeance comic with ghost rider and johnny blaze that's that's on the horizon dc will be doing three green lantern books so if you haven't had your your fix um gerard jones i don't know how much you want to talk about him he did a uh he did a non-fiction book about the history of dc comics it's a really good book though on history of comics it's kind of like uh, adventures of cavalier and clay it came out about the same time um but nonfiction so if you're into the history of comics it's a uh, it's one that i would highly recommend if i could just think of the name <laughs> marvel gears up for a line of future comics and they they mentioned that guardians of the galaxy was a big deal days of future present is a big deal uh once in future thor i guess that was uh not as big of a deal <laughs> <laughs> but it was still uh enough to inspire Marvel to create a line of books in the 2093 universe. Something we'll get into much more as the books start coming out. Obviously, they changed to 2099, but... Uh... And, and all the costumes are different, too. But from the very start, Ravage 2099 was always supposed to be written by Stan, Stan the Man. Yeah. Marvel's uh, Beverly Hills 90210 licensed comic. I don't know if that actually happened or not. If it did... If... <laughs> I don't think it made much of an impact. You know? <laughs> I think its biggest uh, biggest success in comics is probably the mention here in the news section. The Simonson interview from issue number five mentioned that Walt was working on Terminator versus Robocop with Frank Miller, and they're just uh, elaborating a little bit more about that. Some some entrepreneurial uh, mover and shaker has has created uh, poly bags <laughs> that um, protect your comics from from ultraviolet rays. Harvey Comics releases nine new titles, Beetle Bailey, Yogi Bear, Jetson, Scooby-Doo, and Flintstones. And maybe they'll all team up with Batman one day and win many Eisner. They can aspire. <laughs> this is actually pretty cool, man. Mirage releases monster baseball cards that are designed by Gahan Wilson, man. Never heard of them, the, con the cards, but, but I would uh, like to see what these look like. 20,000 pr card print run for these babies talk about eternity and what their claim to fame was and i think it is like the early amera manga robotech one of their licensed properties it would have been the the top of that line and then this is the news item that we mentioned um talking about the image article earlier marvel takes life out off cable and x-force this this goes back again to that valiant article and the image article and the idea that you don't have any standing this guy just sold five million books 
he goes out to create his own comic and now Marvel doesn't like that so they fire him wow you know this has to do with I think poor decision making on the part of Marvel executives and of course they they hire them back you know after Marvel struggles and goes down the tubes they bring Liefeld back you know more than once but it, it you know you read that Valiant article and we make a big deal about you know here are the bean counters and they're totally separate from the creative and that's what you see here you know you see somebody that they don't like this idea that these artists are going to go own their own characters. Yeah, they're going to teach you a lesson. Yeah. Good lesson, man. Because when I was out there at WonderCon and, and uh, checking out Anaheim, I saw the house that Rob bought with his X-Force loot. And then I saw the house that he bought when Extreme Studios was, was really in effect. I heard there's a basketball court in the basement or something like that. <laughs> the Wizard's Crystal Ball by Greg Bowles. But yeah, he he's... Uh... This is the owner of Kingpin Comics, one of the big sellers of Valiant Comics, especially to speculators uh, in this very issue. So, of course, the comic that he's predicting will increase in value or the one he's recommending you buy is Valiant Comics, Archer and Armstrong, number zero. And he mentions that the vast majority of Valiant books printed to date have print runs that are that rarely exceed 50,000 copies. None have ever run over 80,000 copies. He mentions that, you know, there are a hundred copies of X-Men number one to every copy of Exo Man of War that's out there. And there are 200 copies of X-Men number one to every issue of Harbinger number one. So he's trying to pump up the, the scarcity of these Valiant comics. And I did find an article where he does admit to owning a percentage, uh, a significant percentage of Harbinger comics. So it's in his best interest for for these things to remain scarce so that he could pump up the price. And this is definitely one of the things, a lot of people were critical of Wizard Magazine at the time. This is one of the reasons. You know, it was this speculator mentality. Wizard's all over the place. You know, they have creator interviews, publisher interviews. They're doing just promos and PR releases through their news section. And they have the speculator component. And that was something that a lot of uh, industry people were critical of, especially as the speculator bubble burst and and the ramifications start to become clear collecting comics in the 90s by pat mccollum and he's just talking about that idea that we mentioned uh last last episode we were talking about uh selling sizzle and not the steak man he cites several different books that had a lot of a lot of uh national press a lot of outside marketing hype that that penetrated the wider culture and how they became sought after books immediately only to then you know be be worth no more than no more than five bucks or whatever yeah it's funny to see these two articles next to each other because they really <laughs> are you know that that yin and yang balance and and they should be you know like this is a weird business the idea that you were really going to invest in comics and make a bunch of money at this time it does not look good in hindsight and and so uh go pat mccallum pointing you know kind of pointing this out and actually having examples of books that have gone through this cycle that he can point to and say, this is what's happened in the past. It may be what happens again. Uh, kind of a, you know, it's there. Everybody that wants to criticize Wizard for the speculator side of it, this very same spread, you know, you're getting the opposite. So, so we I hear what up, we want to hear. I looked up some some eBay numbers of, of these issues to just see how they've yeah. done over, how they've appreciated or depreciated over time. Uh, Superman 50, the engagement issue is now going for about five bucks. And that's it's like the bare minimum that a comic will pretty much go for on eBay. And most of that cost is just shipping. Action Comics, uh, 662. I believe he reveals his identity to Lois Lane. So that got, you know, national attention, entertainment tonight and such. Five dollars. The outlier is Alpha Flight, which received two printings. Both printings are worth some cash. And the first printing can, you could find between twenty and thirty bucks. And X Men One, uh, I found for three dollars and eighty five cents, and at least two dollars of that was uh, shipping. Yeah, I bought a copy of X Men Number One last weekend for a quarter. And I have, you know, several X Men. Like, I have about thirty thousand comics in this house, and it's not. I generally know where everything is. 
but sometimes it's cheaper for me in terms of saving time <laughs> to just buy another copy of X-Men number one for a quarter than dig through these comics. Yeah, by the way, I could have bought a hundred copies of <laughs> X-Men number one for a quarter. <laughs> this month's number ones. Jim, do you have any uh, that stick out to you? I, I do. Uh, Super Shark Humanoids number one. An intriguing title. <laughs> Great cover. I like pulling out these indie books to give an idea of this is the same time period of Young Blood number one, you know, Spawn number one will be coming out maybe next month or the month after. So this kind of is a cross section of what you're looking at at the time in comics. Small indie book colored with magic markers, I believe. And colored, which means yeah. they, they pumped significant money into the printing of this because very long established comics companies that publish independently, like they they shied away from comics because it was from color because it was cost prohibitive. Yeah, for sure. This was a comic, I think, that was aiming for things like toys and animation deals. And a- who knows, may have even been tied to some company that was, you know, putting some money into it uh, from from one of those outlets. Yeah, look, man, like they have their one comic and they already have a goddamn uh, <laughs> Randy Bowen type sculpture. <laughs> like, yeah, these guys are, uh, there's some stink on that to me. <laughs> eyeball kid one dark horse uh eddie campbell i thought about pulling that out eyeball kid and all those eddie campbell comics are interesting to me because it's a long story you know it's part of, of the bacchus storylines that he would do and they are serialized through all kinds of different formats dark horse presents different mini series but together they make up a big narrative that was a big piece for when i was making aphrodisiac and running you know short stories in different anthologies and how they would come together to be one big story um Eddie Campbell specifically was a a guy that influenced that. Top 100 comics for March 1992. Number one spot is Jim Lee's X-Men. Number five is uh, X-Force plotted by Rob Liefeld. And I wanted to pull this out specifically because it's one of Rob's last comics that he he has a name credit on. Um, He just does the plotting on this and it's like Mark Pasala and Dan Panosian doing their, their best like wannabe. It looks like parody comics. Uh, but I don't hate how it looks. I mean, <laughs> let me say that up front. <laughs> um, but I wanted to pull this issue out because of the ad here, where we have an ad for Youngblood in, in the same issue and the first uh, call out to a uh, Spawn comic by, by Todd McFarlane in, in these uh, these ads. So there's a Spawn ad. And this this is going to develop further even in this issue of Wizard. So let's, let's move forward. Can I make one yeah. note here? Uh, Top 25 books, there's one DC comic in the top 25, and that is Bisley's Lobo's Back, number one. So they don't even have a regular comic in the top 25. You know, that's a very limited series. And something to make note of uh, for the future is in that top 20, uh, Youngblood 1, a Malibu comic, is is in the the top 20 there. Picks from the Wizard's Hat. What year is it, Jim? Infinity War, number one. (laughs) (laughs) It only took Hollywood 25 years to catch up with us. Starlin was talking about how um, in Infinity Gauntlet, he was circumscribed to using like a set amount of characters because like a lot of the editors were very proprietary about characters, especially the the X uh, editors. But when it came time for Infinity War, they were far more liberal with allowing uh, any of their characters to to be a part of the the comic. And I've never read it, but but he said that, you know, he wanted this doppelganger thing to to be happening where everybody's fighting like some sort of alternate version of themselves and stuff. So it just became like a nightmare to draw for for (laughs) poor uh, Ron Lim. I was going to say doing his best George Perez impression there. (laughs) So these are books... These are hot books that are supposed to be shipping in April. And we have the solicitation for Youngblood number three here with uh, Hank. Is it Kaunas or Haunas? It's, 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 K, it's K, 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 yeah, K. Canals, yeah. yeah. Hank Canals. That's unusual for Wizard to uh, have a typo. <laughs> so he concludes his, his three-issue miniseries. It's supposed to have like a glow-in-a-dark cover. It's supposed to... It's supposed to be promoting uh, a future comic called, called Brigade, and it it has it has none of those things. <laughs> um, first off, it comes out in October of this year. In fact, the, the this episode is uh, Wizard Magazine number nine. There's an ad for Wizard Magazine on the interior. 
promoting Wizard Magazine number 14. <laughs> but the other um, ancillary satellite comic from Extreme Studios that are being promoted is uh, Supreme right here. So it's not Brigade, but Brian Murray drawing a Supreme feature. Silver Sable number one, Chromium cover. We'll keep it rocking. X-Men 9, Jim Lee, not John Byrne, Scott Lobdell. Ghost Rider 26, not Matt Wagner, Ron Wagner. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, both X-Men and Ghost Rider, these stories go to uh, New Orleans this month. So maybe they can hang out with Shadow Man. <laughs> and maybe uh, Dickie Betts will be there. Carpool. <laughs> uh, more picks from the Wizard's Hat. Uh, the very first issue mentioned is worth noting. Akira number 37, the, the last uh, Marvel epic issue. Finishing up the story after years of publication. Youngblood number th three is promoted not far after uh, X-Force number 11, which I also pulled out. Uh, you guys remember that ad I just showed you two seconds ago, right? Well, two months later, there's an ad for Youngblood 1, Spawn 1, and the inevitable Dragon 1. The all-new violent superhero by Eric Larson. Hot. Hot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing I forgot on the number ones. Yeah. Is uh, Rust number one, first appearance of Spawn in print, in the form of an ad. In the form of a color ad in the back of a comic book that's not Wizard Magazine number four. <laughs> we still own that, man. You better go get your number four slabbed if you're that kind of person, man. Top ten, April 92. The big difference this month, the only new book, is Amazing Spider-Man number 361, the first appearance of Venom Spawn, a.k.a. <laughs> Carnage. Yeah, so for the rundown, uh, check out the video, all you podcasters, if you care about the top 10 for April 1992. We have more business to attend to. Wizard Market Watch, I didn't pull much uh, from this, with the exception of them being very excited for uh, the image creators' uh, back issues and, and whatnot. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of energy, obviously, going around all of these new books that are coming out from the image guys. This is, the, I think, the first issue that has the Wizard Top 10 Hottest Artist, which was a feature I loved. I, I took it seriously. Got for gospel, man. I, I felt concerned for the artists who slipped a rank. <laughs> <laughs> but excited for those who were climbing the ladder. Yeah, man. Listen, I wanted to know what Stephen Platt looked like. Number one, artist, Jim Lee. Two, Todd McFarlane. Three, Rob Liefeld. Four, Will Sportaccio. Five, Ron Lim. Six, Eric Larson. Seven, John Byrne. Eight, Art Adams. Nine, Mike Zek. Ten, Sam Keith. Mike Zek, by the way, his credits, Deathstroke the Terminator covers. They look fine, but he's not even drawing a comic, is what I'm saying, for a top ten you know, comic book artist. Not, not actively drawing any comics at the time. This month's biggest movers, Alpha Flight number 106, went from 12 to 20 bucks. First appearance of Venom Spawn, uh, Amazing Spider-Man 361 goes from a buck 25 to to 850, and X-Men 201, first appearance of Baby Cable, went from 22 bucks to 35 bucks. Couple new photos, we have Barry Blair from Air Cell and uh, David Quinn, writer of Faust. He'll be he'll have an article pretty soon in uh, the pages of Wizard. The book we always check, New Mutants number 87, first appearance of Cable, is up to $78. And how about that first appearance of Deadpool? Also on the rise, up to $8. Oh, yeah. Comparable to Carnage number one. <laughs> Shows and conventions, we don't care about any place but Pennsylvania. Specifically Western PA. Another spawn appearance for the Portland comic extravaganza. Busy month for PA comic conventions. That's for sure, huh? Monroeville. Comic Book Convention Holiday Inn, $4 admission. I didn't go to that one. That's where uh, Pittsburgh Comic Con used to be, but I don't know that I would have gone this year. I, I did start going to those at some point in, in the maybe mid-90s where I'd have to get a ride. Like I'd have to talk my, my mom into going like shopping at Monroeville Mall or something like that. Um, there's also one in uh, Pit the uh, Comic Book Convention at Sheraton at Station Square, also in Pittsburgh. So good month for... Uh, comic book conventions around here magic words uh jim i have a hard time reading these these uh letters did any of them stick out at you nothing stands out no letter art what do we have we have an archangel by david chun spider-man by rich Hen henneman uh a, a cable by bernie rahadan R radahan 
<laughs> and uh, in a uh, Predator by Tom Whalen. I think there's a famous guy named Tom Whalen. And next issue, we have uh, teased that it's a Rob Liefeld cover cable as well as uh, Shaft will be showing up. This is my first issue of Wizard Magazine from whenever I was a kid. I bet you have every page of this goddamn thing imprinted in your brain. I'm very excited for this one. It's going to be a very very, uh, visceral episode for me. A lot of memories stirred up. Can't wait. You guys got to be here next week when we cover uh, Wizard Magazine number 10. Follow us at every social media platform available. Instagram, Twitter. All the links are in the show notes below. My name's Ed Piscor. Follow me at Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Follow me at Jim Rugg Art. You know, subscribe to the show on YouTube. If you're listening to the podcast feed of the show, we do have a video version. Uh, check that out on YouTube. And uh, we're out. <laughs>